In this video, you're going to learn the key sounds you need to know to be able to play modern worship music at your church. Maybe you're only comfortable playing piano, but you hear people talking about pads, leads, arpeggiated sounds, and you're really not sure what that means. So in this video, I'm gonna break down sound category by sound category, some of the most popular types of sounds that are used in all sorts of modern worship contexts. As I talk about these different categories, you'll see how it all comes together from the keys position at church. So let's start off with the most commonly used kind of keyboard sound pianos. For today's video, I'm using the Sunday Keys app, which is an all-in-one solution with all the keyboard sounds and workflows you need to play live. If you're not a Sunday Keys user, you can follow along with this video because you're going to be able to find sounds similar to the ones I'm using in your hardware keyboard or whatever other solution you use for your church. I'm going to tap Add Sound, and we're going to go to the Sunday Keys library and choose Pianos. Let's start off with the most common kind of piano sound, which is an acoustic grand piano. I'm gonna choose church grand, and here's how this sounds. Now the core idea for what makes a grand piano sound like a grand piano is that at its heart, it's going to evoke the idea that there's a piano actually in the room, sitting on the stage with somebody sitting at that wooden bench playing the piano. But while the piano sound might start there, for a lot of modern worship music, that's just the beginning. There's all sorts of interesting things you can do to make that piano sound more produced and dialed in. You could add reverb, you could compress it, you could change the tone with EQ, and there's all sorts of different kinds of feels to the piano sound as well. I think this is what a lot of people get hung up on because they know there's so much they could be doing, they get a little paralyzed and don't feel like they can make any progress at all. But I wanna to say to you right now that if you can find a grand piano sound on your hardware or in your software that feels good and inspiring to you as you're playing it, that's a good sign that you're on the right track. Don't hesitate to start bringing that sound to your rehearsals and giving it a try. It doesn't have to be incredibly produced or exactly like the original recording for it to make an impact and be an encouragement to your congregation. Let me load in one other acoustic piano sound so you can hear a slightly different feel. This is the SK Grand. It's a much more bright, sort of centered piano sound that's very aggressive in the mix when you play at higher intensity. So that's a little bit about acoustic piano sounds. Now I wanna to touch on electric piano sounds. Back in the day, folks didn't want to lug a grand piano for every performance, so there was all this innovation around reducing the size of pianos, but maintaining as much of the feel or sound as possible. Now, luckily for us, those electric pianos didn't actually sound that much like their acoustic counterparts. They sounded like and ended up sort of being their own unique sort of instrument, but they are awesome and they show up all over modern worship music. Now, we're not gonna get into all of the details, but I will show you one electric piano sound this is called Noisy Roads, and this is the gritty voicing. It has a good bit of bite and distortion to it. Now, one of the most common characteristics for electric piano sounds is the addition of some effects. It's very common to use a chorus effect on an electric piano and also a, a tremolo effect, which sort of is what's making this sound sort of fade in and out rhythmically. So if you'd like to learn more about electric pianos, you can do some Googling. Classic models to check out are the Rhodes and Wurlitzer electric pianos, and you'll find lots of great options for electric pianos inside of software like Sunday Keys if you want something that's a little bit more ready to play. Now, one more type of piano sound I wanna to talk to you about are digital piano sounds. So I'm gonna swap out this Rhodes piano with this DXE Piano 1. Now, after electric pianos rose to prominence, folks started using digitally synthesized alternatives as we got into the late 80s and the early 90s. Again, the idea was you don't want to lug an acoustic piano to every show or maybe can't afford one for your church, but you want to sound as close as possible. Again, luckily for us, these digital pianos actually ended up sounding kind of like their own thing, but they are all over modern worship music today because they're so instantly recognizable and bring a distinct 
character to the mix. Now, this is a classic FM piano from a vintage synthesizer released in the 80s. Uh, let me just play it for you, see if you recognize it. It's pretty common sound. Very distinct from an acoustic piano and also distinct from the Rhodes electric piano I just played. But don't let all of this nuance and specificity freak you out. Again, the core idea is, does the piano feel good to play? Is it responsive? Can you fit the moment that you're trying to fill? If the answer is yes, then give it a go at rehearsal and I think that you'll enjoy bringing that new character to the table. Now let's talk about pads. If you've heard that term before but you're not sure what it means, it doesn't have to be a complicated answer. I like to think of a pad as any sort of sound that will continue to ring out for as long as I play or hold notes on my keyboard or with a sustain pedal and that fills this sort of ambient space. It's often used to layer in with a sound like a piano. So I'm gonna go to add a sound here and go to pads. I'm gonna just load in this alter call pad sound. Let's hear how this sounds. So notice that this pad is just gonna to continue to sustain. I'm holding my sustain pedal down and the pad is always going to last for as long as I keep holding these notes. This is what makes it so useful because you play a piano chord and it starts to fade out over time and that's really where a pad layered in keeps that space filled really nicely. So I'm gonna bring this piano back in so you can hear how these two ingredients work together. This is the meat and potato sound of modern worship music. And if you're gonna focus on bringing one combination to your worship band, a good piano and a good pad has got to be it. Now one thing that throws people off when it comes to finding a great pad is that you can really describe almost any synthesized sound as a pad. And they can be really, really wild. Some pads might be absolutely all bright, hiss, uh, aggressive. Others might be super dark, low, and rumbly. The most common kind of pad sound for modern worship music could be described as a warm pad. That means it's not too aggressive, it's not too bright, and it's also not so dark that it gets in the way in the low end, uh, distracting from the bass or just making people feel like there's thunder in the room. You really want a pad sound that just sort of hangs out underneath everything else that's going on in the mix. Now there's all sorts of nuance on top of that, but the most important thing is it sustains as long as you hold it and it fills sort of that right space underneath what everybody else is doing. Now the other thing that really intimidate some people when it comes to finding pad sounds is that it feels like they're not actually that in control of what the pad is doing. This especially can become an issue if you are layering your pad with a piano sound, for example. Because if you play a bunch of notes on that piano, the pad is going to try and keep up because it's also playing all of those notes. This is where the pad can start to grow and grow because the piano notes are fading out over time but every note you play it on that pad is just gonna to continue to sustain. So they can start to build up and get in the way. So this oftentimes is what turns people off from using pads with confidence because they feel like it's just hard to keep them in control. So there's a couple simple things you can do. Make sure that you pick a pad sound that fills the right frequency space for the songs you're trying to play. Look for keywords like warm pad in whatever software or hardware you're using. And if you have the ability to, maybe open up a little EQ plugin to try and cut out some of those frequencies that stand out too much in the mix. Once you've got the right sort of feel for the pad sound itself while you're sustaining, you can also make sure that it fades in a little bit over time. It doesn't enter too dramatically. And oftentimes you also want that pad to fade out a little bit over time as you release it. This means that as you're playing chord changes, there's sort of this almost string bow effect like an orchestra where the pad is smoothly fading from one note into the next or from one chord into the next. So I like to refer to these ideas as sort of the way the pad is voiced, the way that it responds to your playing. So I recommend as you're looking for pads, 
try them on their own first and then layer them in with a piano sound or whatever sort of lead instrument you're gonna be using because that's when you'll really start to notice whether the pad actually feels like you're in control or if it's controlling or limiting what you're able to play. Now let's spend a minute talking about lead synth sounds. This might be scary to you if you've never played a lead keyboard part on stage, but you can do this in a way that doesn't have to feel super scary. To start off with, sometimes maybe it's just isolating that one lead keys part on a song like This Is Amazing Grace. And you could really easily pull in a sound. If you're on a hardware keyboard or in software, look for something that just says bright lead or big lead, dance lead, trance lead, those sorts of things, saw lead, all of these sorts of terms are gonna be this big bright sound like this. If it's your first time playing a big lead sound, I recommend not trying to multitask and also play piano and pad. Ask your guitarist to fill that space for you and let you focus on nailing that lead part. That's sort of your moment to shine. If the guitarist was playing a lead part, they wouldn't also be expected to play rhythm. So don't ask yourself to do that if this is something that's new and intimidating to you. Later on, you're probably going to be asked to play more than one thing at a time. So you might be able to uh, layer this piano and pad in with the lead sound. And you can do some cool things like adjust the splits or the layer ranges of your sounds. So we could go here and just say, we want this lead sound in the right hand only. All modern software and hardware is going to be able to do these splits. How exactly you do it is gonna depend on the specific gear that you're using. But now I've got this lead sound in the right hand and piano and pad in the left hand. So I can do that exact part, but with some separation between them. And because that lead part is constrained to the right hand, I can play just my piano and pads below it. So the last tip I'll leave you with for lead parts is making sure it's only in the right place on the keyboard is gonna go a long way anytime you need to do some multitasking. Next, let's talk about rhythmic elements. If you go into any modern worship song and you listen to all the keys parts in detail, you're gonna hear these sort of repetitive background elements where you're having certain notes repeat over and over, maybe playing the notes in a chord or just playing a simple phrase over and over in the background. And most of the time, these are actually just written into the score while they're recording the song. But if you were gonna play them live, you'd use something like an arpeggiator or a sequencer to be able to replicate that. Thanks to modern software, it's not hard to do so. Specifically in Sunday Keys, there's an entire category devoted to arpeggiated and sequenced sounds. So let me just give you one or two examples. This one's called Simple Worship Arp. It's represented by this purple bar here on screen. So anywhere I play in that range, all of those notes are gonna be fed into the arpeggiator. This is the arpeggiator view. All of these bars represent the velocity of any note. So as I play, the pattern moves through the notes in sequence. It's a really cool effect, especially when you start to layer it in with other sounds. An arpeggiator effect takes whatever you feed into it and outputs it rhythmically in a repeating pattern. But sometimes you want more specific notes. In those cases, you might actually want to play back a sequence of notes that is exactly what you've programmed it to be. So let me give you an example of a sound that has been sequenced. I'm gonna use the same bass example, but choose simple worship sequence. So this particular sequence has only the bass notes triggering the output. And if I open this up, you can see how this programming works. Because these bass notes alone trigger the sequence, I'm able to leave my right hand completely free to focus on the pad and the piano, but still fill that space. Now, 
all modern software and most modern hardware will have a built-in arpeggiator and possibly the ability to sequence notes. But how simple or complex that is going to be for you to program is going to vary a good deal from hardware and software. The Sunday Keys app makes it really simple to program sequences and arpeggiators, and if you play in time, then they will play back in time as well. Next up, let's talk about some extra texture that you can bring to your sound. It doesn't have to be all pianos, pads, and synths. A lot of modern worship music will sort of repurpose classic sounds and make it a part of the overall mix. So what we might do is add an organ sound that has a good bit of reverb on it. So here's a classic Hammond B3 organ sound that's been washed out in reverb and has a tremolo effect on it as well. So it definitely sounds like an organ, but it's playing for me like a pad. So I can bring in this pad layer as well, and it takes that pad to another level. And that brings up a common thing in a lot of modern worship music that you'll hear more than one pad or pad-like sound layered together in the mix. This fills a nice bit of space and adds specific character to the songs that you're playing. So that's how an organ sound can be layered with a pad, and you can also layer string sounds with pads. I'm going to choose springs and bring in this wispy violin waves. This is a very cool sort of nuanced string sound. Hear how it affects and layers with this pad. Here's the pad without those strings. It's sort of static and just sort of hanging out way underneath everything in the mix, which might be what you want. But as you're building, you could bring in this string layer to add more energy, movement, and intensity to your patch. Next up, let's talk about the low end, specifically synth bass sounds. Now, when you think about playing bass sounds from the keyboard, I'm not talking about replacing your bass player. I'm talking about layering in and enhancing what he or she is doing, adding extra depth, extra character, and definition to the low end of your sound. So I'm going to replace this string sound with a bass. I'm going to pull in this sub bass sound and let you hear how it sounds on its own. So it's subtle, there's not a lot of brightness, the attack isn't really intense. If you had a real bass player on stage playing or picking rhythmically, this would not get in the way. It would just move more air through those subwoofers and make the band sound more powerful. Check out what it adds to this pad sound when the two are layered together. We'll bring in the piano. lead sound a little bit. So we're using bass in modern worship music a lot of the time as an extra layer of enhancement and polish. Almost every modern worship album that comes out is absolutely covered in synth bass. From song to song, you're going to find more songs with synth bass in them than without. But again, you're not stepping on your bass player's toes. If anything, you're actually making them sound bigger and more powerful. The most important thing for a bass sound, it's kind of the same idea as a lead sound. You don't want your bass sound all the way up here in your right hand. You only want it down in the low end. And you want to really specifically set which notes you want to be able to play that bass from and which you don't. So then if you're playing piano in the middle, you're not accidentally triggering a really high bass note. You also want to make sure that the bass sounds you choose actually do blend in well with not just your own key sounds, but with your bass player, with the guitarist. You don't want a really bright, growly, aggressive bass sound for your slow, tender, quiet worship songs. 
you want something a little bit more subtle. Other times you might really want something aggressive if you're playing a, a techno or EDM song from a band like Hillsong, Young and Free. There's a wide range of bass sounds available. Make sure it's only playable where you want it to be and that the sound you choose complements the overall mix of your band. So maybe you find yourself feeling really intimidated as you watch this video. Maybe you say, David, I'm a traditionally trained piano player. I'm not comfortable adding all of these other sounds into the mix. I just play piano. What I want to say to you is, first off, if you're classically trained, you are probably way overqualified to play much of modern worship music. So you're not going to have any trouble playing the parts that you're going to be asked to play. And when it comes to layering in more sounds and stepping into new areas, oftentimes it doesn't require much of you other than simple changes to your mindset. So I've got this piano sound right here. And I'm playing it as just a piano sound. I'm going to play the exact same thing, and I'm just going to bring in these other layers that we've been talking about throughout this video. And without changing my playing style at all, hear what's possible. If you have more questions about finding the right sounds, I'd love to recommend our Sunday Keys app as a great place to start with everything you need, including incredible sounds and simple workflows for you to be able to do what we just did. Find and identify the right sounds for your songs so that you can bring something great to your worship team. We'll put a link in the description if you'd like to learn more about Sunday Keys. If you're a worship keys player or a worship leader who found this video valuable, please consider subscribing to the channel and hit the notification bell so you don't miss our next video.